right, <clears throat> here we go. Uh, thank you for granting us some of your time. Um, we just picked up the case and would appreciate if you uh, give us your story. Have you us. read the files? I put everything I had in there. Uh, of, of course, but uh, we believe it will help us understand it better if we hear it from your perspective, uh, complementary to the files that you provided for us. October 5th, 2015. What seems to be a normal day in Waterbury, Connecticut, becomes the beginning of a nightmare. It was around early October when the first incident presented itself, and honestly, it was completely unexpected. Eve Johnson, a senior at UConn, was out on a walk by the lake the night of the incident. According to friends and relatives, this was normal for her. At first, we weren't exactly sure what to think it was possible that no one else was involved. Eve was said to be at the lake at around 11 p.m. on the 5th. It wasn't until three days later when the police got a call from the parents reporting their daughter's disappearance. When we found the first girl, she was by the lake. She had a swollen ankle, so we believe maybe she got hurt and was unable to move, unable to get help, and then froze to death since, well, it's cold out at night. Right, but were there any initial signs of a struggle that would indicate an abuser? We did not find any conclusive evidence to support that theory. At the time, Eve Johnson's death was perceived as a standalone case. But there was one thing that linked it to the rest. One bizarre detail that would not be noticed until later. We were just about to close that case and another one appeared totally out of the blue. At first, we thought it was different in almost every way, or so we thought. Five days after the death of Eve Johnson and two days after her body was found, another unfortunate death occurred. This time, it was post-university junior, Jessica Evans. But unlike Eve, it was clear that someone had murdered Jessica. On Sunday, October 15th, at approximately 7 a.m., Jessica Evans' body was found by some of her classmates. As they came to pick her up for class, what they found was shocking. Jessica was strangled to death. People knew Eve and felt for her when she was found, but Jessica? Oh my God, she was popular. She was a track star, a soccer sensation. She was in all the shows at her school. They loved her. It was already a big pressure on us because of who she was and how popular she was, but in reality, we made it much, much worse on ourselves. Uh, how so? We mentioned that there was a possible connection between the two deaths. We just mentioned it. There was outrage. People were generally furious on that. Although both crime scenes were very different, there was one thing in particular that was found in both cases. Next to the body of Eve Johnson was a rubber duck painted blue, and a second one near the body, floating on the lake. The interesting thing about the ducks is this. The first one laying next to Eve was painted blue, and that could point to Eve freezing to death. And then catch this. The duck floating on the river had paint highlighting his neck. Two days later, we find Jessica and two ducks on her dresser, one with the neck highlighted, which we now know was meant to represent her, and the other with its wing painted a completely different color. When news broke, the comments sparked the public's interest, with news reports suggesting of a serial killer and a killing spree. The public panicked, putting more pressure on law enforcement. Uh, how much pressure did you, did you face? It was huge. It was a bunch of rich girls getting murdered. The pressure went up fast. Last time I got threatened that much, <laughs> during my divorce. 
with that amount of pressure on you, it's just way too easy to push the wrong way. The investigation quickly turned into a witch hunt, with Lorraine, Eve's stepmom, becoming the primary suspect of both crimes. Eve and Lorraine were known to have arguments. Neighbors would constantly complain of shouting and broken glass late at night. <clears throat> well, a large amount of crimes are committed by someone the victim knows. Uh, do, you, do you believe that this was the case here? Yeah, we weren't sure who had the motive to kill not one but two girls. Finding Lorraine's possible motive, now, well, that wasn't hard. And she should remain the primary suspect, correct? She would. Not because we had anything against her, no, but she was the only one who made sense. So how does Lorraine connect to Jessica's death? That was one of the issues we faced. Lorraine and Jessica's family had been members of the same country club, and we'd already heard reports of some feuding between the two. So could it have been jealousy or revenge that pushed Lorraine to kill? Well, we both know the two of those are off the bat a hell of a catalyst. With Lorraine under investigation, activity for the now-coined rubber duck murderer seemed to have stopped. That would be the case until October 22nd, 2015, when Blake Harris, a backup quarterback at UConn, was found dead in his car on the side of the road. His arm had been cut off. As a result, he bled out. After this incident, there was a public outcry, calling for Detective Strong's resignation. After weeks of threats and little to no progress, the pressure proved to be too strong for Detective Strong to handle. Crushed by the inability to solve the case and by the deaths of promising kids, Detective Strong was taken off the case and soon after would file for retirement. This would be the last case in his career. After we pointed out Lorraine, we knew we messed up big time. We really got punched in the mouth. The timing could not have been worse. We tried to shake it off, tried to reset ourselves, tried to get on the right path. But after Blake, well, that's when I knew. I mean, I just couldn't anymore. The pressure was too much. Everything just seemed too difficult. Hmm. I failed them. And have you kept up with the investigation? No. No, I haven't. Well, there's been another incident, uh, a mutilation. Somebody's heart was ripped out, removed from their body. Jesus Christ. Yes, uh, we need um, to ask you some questions. Uh, you uh, wh where were you on the night of February 5th of this year? I was home. So you weren't anywhere near Lakeview Drive, is that right? No, I wasn't. What is this all about? I, I just find it a little odd that you let a case... Uh, there was conflict of interest, and somehow you never made any real progress to solve it. What are you implying? What really was your role in the investigations, investigating the crimes that you committed? Are you out of your mind? Walk me through how they fit in your life. No? <laughs> okay, I'll tell it. It was late night, raining. A young lady by the name of Abigail Strong was driving home from work. Out of nowhere, some rich kids speeding through carelessly lost control and crashed into the girl's car she didn't survive spoiled rich bastards don't even get a slap on the wrist you know because it was raining and anyone could have lost control right that doesn't prove anything after your daughter's death you and your wife try to maintain the relationship and work it out. How did that end? And that doesn't prove anything. They ruined your life. Then they walked away as if nothing happened. They took her from you. Maybe, maybe it was time to flip the tables. So I think that you killed them because you needed there to be justice for your daughter. Does that sound about right? You are desperate. You can't figure it out, so you are jumping to conspiracies and grasping at any straw your greasy fingers can reach. I can tell you right now, it's not going to work. I can also tell you your career will not last one second longer than my drive home. And I do believe this was a voluntary interview. And I've given you way more time than you deserve. So please, don't ever contact me again.